Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fourth in our series of COVID-19 CEO Leadership Series. I am Missy Hughes, the CEO of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, and we're super glad to have you here. Um, we've really enjoyed these series, and we are learning more and more every week, and this week we have a great group of panelists. So this series is in partnership with the Regional Leadership Council, which are key strategic partners of WEDC. You can see the map in front of you um, listing the nine different organizations around the state that help with economic development and help WEDC do our jobs. We all work together um, and we're bringing this series to you because we really want to be getting information out across the state about key uh, things to be thinking about in this current crisis as business leaders, as business owners, and um, as, as partners in getting through this challenge together. We all have things to learn from each other, and we've been able to have this series of uh, different webinars to really help us think about uh, what we're facing as we're balancing lives and livelihoods and trying to find the ways for government and the private sector and the healthcare sector to all work together to get through this. So this week we have a really um, a good a panel, a great panel, and I'm excited to get into the conversation. Uh, last week we had some bumps. Um, I invite you to go back and view the, um, uh, the uh, help me, the webinar from last week and uh, catch up on what's happening there. We still have some of the handouts that are available from last week, including what you're seeing here, the Badger Bounce Back Plan and the Wisconsin Ready Plan. I really invite you to dig in on both of these to understand the work that's happening at the state level to stand up testing and contact tracing and isolation, key tools in the fight against COVID-19. And then of course, Wisconsin Ready is my team and our effort with the RLC to get Wisconsin ready for the time when we really get the, the economic momentum uh, going again, and we're really working together to reopen Wisconsin, as we've all been talking about. Um, these are the things that are happening at the state level, and we're looking for your help in uh, all moving forward together. So um, let me tell you about our panel this week. We have Dr. John Raymond once again uh, joining us to share with us his most current knowledge and thinking on the COVID-19 crisis. This is an evolving situation and every day we're looking at the data and trying to understand what are we learning, how is this virus behaving and what's happening with it. Uh, so we look forward to Dr. Raymond's um, comments. We have Dr. Lisa Dodson, the campus dean of Medical College of Wisconsin, a colleague of Dr. Raymond's and glad to have Dr. Dodson here to share her thoughts on what's happening. I'm really excited to have Michelle Goss. Michelle is the CEO of Kohl's Corporation, headquartered here in Wisconsin, but a really uh, amazing business I've learned more about in the last few weeks. Uh, and, and I look forward to hearing about uh, what Kohl's is thinking in this current situation. Finally, we have Dave Flager. Dave is the president and owner of Lemke Industrial Machine. And of course, you know, with manufacturing being so critically important in Wisconsin, we look forward to hearing how Dave is approaching these challenges <clears throat> and what we're working on. Um, I'm gonna encourage you please to enter your questions in the uh, question box. Uh, last week, we weren't able to take questions and I know Dr. Raymond is eager to answer your questions and to hear what you're thinking about. We have Dr. Raymond um, with us uh, not for the whole webinar, so I encourage you, if you're thinking about questions, we'll get those taken care of right off the block. Um, so we're gonna do something a little different this time. Uh, this webinar, we are starting a quick poll. And so in a moment, you're gonna see the opportunity to answer just a, a multiple choice question. What do you expect in your uh, next 90 days for your business or organization? And so if you can select one of those, um, we are not allowed to vote. Organizing panels, we're not going to throw the vote off. But uh, So there's five choices there, and we're going to get the responses right away. And by having those responses right away, we'll be able to talk about that with our panelists. So if you could just take a moment and answer those, and then we can uh, rock and roll with Dr. Raymond. I'm excited to see how this turns out. All right, so we're gonna head to Dr. Raymond now. 
And Dr. Raymond, I just always want to thank you so much for sharing your insights into what's happening. Um, I've done a little extra work recently to dig into um, metrics and what these things mean. So I'm excited to hear where you're thinking we currently are as far as our metrics go and what you're seeing as next steps and things we should be keeping an eye on. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Missy. Are we ready for the first slide? We are. I threw up the results of the poll quickly so you can interpret that. And I will advance to the first slide here in one moment, Doctor. Okay. We're going thanks, Sarah. Well, thanks, height. Missy. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. And if we could go to the first data slide, um, I just want to quickly go through some of the indicators of COVID-19 pandemic in Wisconsin. You're familiar with uh, most of these from previous webinars. But I did want to say that we're making great progress. So the doubling time for COVID-19 in Wisconsin has stretched out to 13 days as measured by the Medical College of Wisconsin. And the daily growth rates have been suppressed, which is good, to 4.5% as determined by the Medical College of Wisconsin. We're also tracking the percentage of positive tests. Uh, and those were at 6.9% Wednesday although they rose to 10.8% yesterday, according to Wisconsin DHS. The number of positive tests in Wisconsin reached a new high of 334 yesterday, according to DHS, in large part due to the increased availability of testing, but also due to some, um, some clusters of cases that we're tracking. The testing capacity consistently has been increasing in Wisconsin, according to DHS and our ICU and ventilator capacity is adequate according to the Wisconsin Hospital Association. And although we continue to be challenged by uh, a lack of uh, good supply chain and personal protective equipment, that remains stable according to the Wisconsin Hospital Association. Can I go to the next slide, please? This slide just gives you some insight into the remarkable increase in the statewide capacity to test COVID-19 that we've experienced over the last few weeks. And the testing capacity shown in the blue line, and as you can see, uh, that has increased to almost 11,000 tests per day, which is very close to approaching our goal of at least 85,000 tests per week. So great work. I also want to specifically call out Exact Sciences and Promega for their willingness to address Wisconsin's needs by working with our government to help increase that testing capacity. Could we go to the next slide, please? This slide shows two Badger bounce back gating metrics for COVID-19 testing. Now draw your attention to the vertical scale on the right. The light blue bars show daily tests administered and the pink bars show the number of positive tests each day. The black line shows the percentage of positive tests and these numbers are tied to the vertical scale on the left. Next slide, please. I do want to acknowledge that we're in a time of transition I think we've reached a new equilibrium with COVID-19 by all the great work that we've done to enhance social distancing, to take personal accountability, to have corporate accountability, and to comply with the Badger Bounce Back Plan and the Safer at Home Orders. Now, the Badger Bounce Back Plan does anticipate a phased reopening of segments of our economy using criteria that work like gates. And the main focus areas are symptoms, cases, healthcare system capacity, testing, contact tracing, and protective equipment. For example, these criteria include a two-week decline of symptoms of influenza or COVID-like syndromes. Two-week declines of total positive COVID-19 tests accompanied by a two-week decline of the percentage of positive tests. And there are hospital capacity metrics that are currently under development. And looking ahead, I think we can anticipate more testing capacity for COVID-19 infections and incorporation of serological or antibody testing, as well as a growing number of public health tools. And as we continue to transition from crisis mitigation to recovery, we'll need continued surveillance of new cases and monitoring of hospital intensive care unit capacity. And we'll also need to refine workplace health and safety best practices. And in that regard, I really want to praise the outstanding work of WMC and the MMAC in leading the way using national best standards. We're also going to need mitigation strategies in case we have a resurgence of cases or a second wave of COVID-19. 
and we need to help our public get comfortable with living responsibly in a world of continuing risk from COVID-19. Next slide, please. And on this final slide, I just want to talk about the concepts of workplace health and safety principles. We need to prepare and protect our workforce, our customers, and our facilities. And this framework incorporates best practices from the CDC, WHO, and OSHA, and is really centered around continued social distancing, hygiene, and sanitization practices. And I believe that this framework can facilitate cross-sector collaboration to the benefit of all of us here in Wisconsin. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Missy. Thanks, Dr. Raymond. So we've got a number of questions and I wanna see if I can um, uh, clump them a little bit, but but you touched on a few things. And so I wanna come back and, and just really be clear about um, the gating criteria. So we're looking for a downward trend on the symptoms. There's there's two symptom gating criteria, and then there's the, ca the cases gating criteria. On the cases, as you're testing more and more people, which is great, right? We're ramping up the testing. We're doing well with that, thanks to Exact Sciences and Pro Omega. How do we, we're testing more, we're going to find more. So how do we ever get ahead of this gating criteria? Can you help explain that for folks? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Missy, and I think that's why they uh, incorporated the percentage of positive tests. I think if you're getting control of the pandemic, you want to see that the number of tests may be leveling off and that the positive tests, but that the percentage of positive tests is going down. So I think that that's what the thinking was behind bundling those two together as a metric. And when you see spikes happening, um, you know, we all know about the Brown County outbreak, um, other outbreaks like that. How do we uh, balance that in these gating criteria? Really good question again, Missy. Um, I think the best way to, to look at these outbreaks is to make sure that we, one, have good testing capacity, and two, that our public health officials can rapidly identify the COVID-19 positive patients trace all of their contacts and then do appropriate isolation. And I'm really optimistic that over the last few weeks, our public health infrastructure has been bolstered by some things that the state is doing and by uh, really just a grassroots effort to organize the municipal and county public health uh, officials to make sure that we have a, a good infrastructure. Great, great, thank you. Um, one of the things that I, I, you, you kind of drove up to, but I wanna come back to is liability for um, employers as they bring workers into their workplace or they bring um, customers into their shops. What's the, what's your take on, you know, how we manage the liability questions surrounding this? Well, I'm not an attorney, but <laughs> I, I would say that if, if we use federal guidelines uh, for best practices and that we look at a scorecard like WMC has proposed that can be publicly posted and it's very consistent, that that would go a long way towards reassuring our employees that the employers are doing everything they can to protect them, the customers, and to have a safe workplace. Great, thank you. And you did touch on the WMC um, scorecard that's been presented. Can you talk to me a little bit about how, what you're thinking as far as a regional approach to uh, this challenge or, you know, or even more about the WMC uh, uh, tool that's been developed? Yeah, two schools of thought. One is that we should work as a state and have consistent criteria across the state. And I think that in part recognizes that we're a mobile society and we're not really restricting people from traveling in the state. So uh, all it takes is one person to get a haircut in Minocqua who is COVID-19 positive or to go to a restaurant there and you could have an outbreak. Um, the other philosophy is that different regions of the state have different population densities. There are different places in terms of handling the pandemic and that we should regionalize the approach. I would say that um, that could work, but we need that public health infrastructure and a lot more testing ability than we have right now for that really to work. And the WMC plan, it really has a lot of very desirable elements in it. But what I think is missing is that um, acknowledgement that we need the uh, public health infrastructure and that if we have a surge that we can't control regionally, that we may need to have statewide mitigation. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question about Georgia. 
And I'm wondering, uh, you know, I think I think that the question is really focused on when will when, in your opinion, will we start to see um, effects of or that it's going to be OK uh, in Georgia, uh, you know, either increased cases or, you know, when will we start to understand the impact of decisions to reopen that we're seeing in other states? Right. Well, you would expect that if there was going to be a dramatic increase in COVID-19 cases, that they would happen within the first week to 10 days. But what I've seen is that a lot of people are actually afraid to go back into especially restaurants and bars. And so that there is some self-restraint in the social distancing. I actually think that's good. And it's very similar to what we're trying to do here, which is dialing up the economy in, in a phased fashion. People are doing that. But I'm a little concerned because they have a much higher burden of COVID-19 than we do and really have not been able to reach an equilibrium. They were actually still on the rising part of the curve. So that causes some concern for me. Great. And before I turn to Dr. Dodson, I just want to uh, come back. There was um, one more question of, you know, overall, I hear you saying that we've reached an equilibrium. Um, so when we talk about flattening the curve, of course, we're learning and, you know, we, we get stuck with these phrases like flattening the curve or in my world, essential versus non-essential. So you feel like, I guess what I would say is we're kind of riding the top of the curve, hopefully at this point, and we'll start to see it go down, but we're still kind of at the, that top of that moment. I think we're probably starting to go down. Okay. Um, and this is really based on conversations that I've had with public health officials and with our health system CEOs. Um, you know, we want to be cautious, but I really do believe that we're starting to trend downward very slow, uh, but the trend seems to be in the right direction. And what I want to make sure everyone understands is we have not, we've not crushed the curve. We flattened it and that we've reached an equilibrium that's probably acceptable for starting the phased reopening of our economy that Governor Evers has already done in two phases. Um, but we really need to be diligent about maintaining social distancing and, and to maintain um, a, a, a good eye on the metrics that we decide are most important. Great. Well, I really appreciate, Dr. Raymond, you're always being so available and um, uh, being willing to explain these things to lay people like us. I'm going to uh, turn to your colleague, Dr. Dodson. Uh, good morning, Dr. Dodson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're experiencing and your perspective, and especially, I think it's great to keep reminding us about what the healthcare industry is experiencing during this time. Great. Yeah, I'm going to focus on just two um, aspects of, of uh, subsets of what Dr. Raymond has already talked about. One is how this is affecting rural hospitals and health systems. Um, and then the second is on the medical education uh, piece of this. So I'm up here in Wausau, uh, which by my background, I don't consider to be a rural community, but it's very close and it's a jumping off point to rural communities all over the northern half of the state. So we are here as a resource to the community and to develop a workforce for smaller hospitals in the Northwoods of Wisconsin is, is the mission of my campus. Um, so I think that, that the things that are different about the rural health system systems and communities. Um, one is that it's really tough from the front lines. I think one of the things that, that's a challenge in a rural health system is the frontline doctor who's actually greeting patients in the emergency room is probably also whole, wearing three other hats. And so again, there's, a, there's um, because resources are so thin, that person is probably also holds an administrative role and probably also holds a whole bunch of other um, things that make it more challenging to do that job. The other piece is that rural health health systems are you often now have been purchased by other health systems from farther away who may have zero idea what it's like to be practicing in Rhinelander or you know somewhere Ladysmith or somewhere in the northern part of Wisconsin and the and the realities of that. Um, one of the things that Dr. Raymond talked about that's really important is the increase in testing. That has not gotten to rural areas yet. We have very limited rural te testing capacity and most of it is still being sent off. So it's multiple days from the time that someone is tested. We have to increase that to really open up our rural health systems. One of the things that's very clear to me having practiced in rural areas and, and researched this for decades now is that rural health is economic development. 
it plain and simple. The smaller your community, the more important your hospital is because it holds a bigger and bigger piece of the puzzle. The other piece is education. And I think all the effects of, of our education system being essentially shut down are starting to be felt as well. So we know that all of the, the testing and the PPE um, personal protective equipment and things will not last forever and we need to address those shortages in rural areas on a more aggressive timeline if we're going to safely reopen rural economies. Um, policies that are also responsive to the needs now but can grow and adapt are really, really important for rural areas. And then the cross-system collaboration and planning, which is not a hallmark of the healthcare systems in recent decades. Um, you know, a lot of times these rural hospitals, their nearest resource is in a competing health system. And we need to really smooth that out and really start doing better cross-system planning and collaboration. Um, and the smaller the hospital system is, the, the more important that is, the more remote it is. Um, about our communities, I think anybody who's lived in a rural area knows that we fix things with baling wire and chewing gum. You know, I mean, we are adaptable, resourceful people in rural areas, and we know how to get stuff done if we get the resources. Um, in fact, when I practiced, we used to have our Wrigley moments. We would call them, it's like, get out the Wrigley's, we're going to be patching this with a, with a pack of chewing gum. And that's really common, and people are very accustomed to doing that, but we do need some resources because we have an older, sicker population, often poorer, often with language barriers, a high percentage of our Hmong um, and Latino, Latino populations live in rural areas and have language issues, and we're just farther from things, which, which also is, is troublesome. Um, we have communication issues. We have transportation issues. You know, if I put a sick patient in the ambulance to take them 70 miles away, um, that takes the ambulance out of commission for some long period of time by the time they get there, get back and clean the thing. So again, transportation issues are really, really big. Um, we have a lot of different surge capacity issues. And if we can go on to the next slide, I was just gonna bring up one of those. Um, actually, go to the next slide. I'll, I'll skip this one for right now. Um, so this is actually, I was going to use the Green Bay example, but I couldn't find, I just prepared this last night, so I didn't have time to get that all together. But Logansport, Indiana is a really great example. It's a small town in central Indiana, 18,000 people, 75 miles from Indianapolis, one hospital that is 83 beds total, but it's only staffed for 44. And they have um, 677 employees at total at the hospital and an annual admission of 1,600 patients or so, about four to five a day. The Tyson meat plant there this week just came down with 900 new cases. So if you wow. assume a 10% hospitalization rate, which is fairly reasonable for those patients, you just completely blew that hospital out of the water with one plant coming down with um, a really bad outbreak. So I think rural, it just points out how much more vulnerable the rural areas are and how we have to develop plans. And again, one one thing sometimes people will say is, well, just put them in an ambulance and take them to Indianapolis. Well, A, Indianapolis may not have capacity, and B, you can't take the ambulances out of commission for everything else that needs to happen, and that whole hospital will be dedicated now to, to COVID. So I think those are some of the examples of things that we deal with in rural areas. And um, if I could go on to the next slide, I'll just talk briefly about education. So I'm a medical educator, as is Dr. Raymond and others. Um, it's a really highly regulated industry. So we have now rules and regulations we're trying to put into a situation that has never happened before. And yet we have a very time sensitive situation. We have to graduate students on a certain schedule uh, so they don't fall behind. We managed to get all of our students ready for graduation this year, but right now we're tr struggling to figure out how on earth we're going to get them the clinical exposures they need to be able to graduate a class next year. And we don't have the option of just saying, well, it's a long pipeline. We'll just add more people to it later. We, the, the, the pipeline of medical education requires a fairly smooth, you know, consistent approach. Um, it's very resource intensive and it's mission critical to our rural hospitals and other, all our healthcare facilities. So um, just a really important concept to keep in mind. And then the last slide I think is next. Um, yeah, so clinic, so some, the, the, 
challenges that we're facing and the opportunities is we need the business community to help partner with us to um, find creative ways to solve these, some of these problems. And I think the business community uh, supports a great deal of the healthcare system, but get left out of the discussion around medical education very often, um, even though they're funding a lot of the healthcare um, that we're going to be uh, using. Uh, we, we need to engage businesses more often. I think that's a real opportunity that we've missed in the past. Um, we are switching a lot of things to online that requires intensive use of resources. We are doing different kinds of assessment and evaluation, um, how we prepare our students to meet the needs that you all see as the business community. That's part of our professional identity formation, how we become the kinds of specialists we're going to our communities need, how we are prepared to deal with the patient centeredness and the business centeredness that we need and keep our physicians and healthcare providers well. I mean, we already had a burnout problem prior to this crisis and it's only going to become more prevalent. So um, I'll stop there and uh, if there's questions or I can stick around till the end to take more questions. Thank you, Missy. Thank you, Dr. Dodson. Boy, that was a really uh, great explanation of what I've seen and experienced. So I live in Vernon County. We have one case here um, and, you know, it seems like there should be opportunities to do more, but at the same time, I uh, have relationships with a few of the docs that are located at our hospital and we don't have a ventilator. We've had shortages of PPP and, you know, obviously, you know, the testing is still a challenge. Um, you know, I've tried to share with them that I've heard testing capacity is available and I get a little head shaking at me, <laughs> like not here. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the questions that we got is that all, you know, we have to be cautious about lumping all rural together. Um, that there are, you know, facilities. So if I think about us here in uh, Vernon County, we've got Gunderson and Franciscan Skemp um, right up the road in La Crosse. Uh, you know, how do, how do we balance that out? I, I appreciate your comment about the ambulance. That was something I hadn't even really, you know, ever thought about. Well, I, I moved here from Wisconsin from Oregon and practiced in a place that is both both rural and remote. It's frontier. So it was 150 miles to anything that was bigger than we were. And the critical access hospital, the dock there was the only one for the entire three county area a lot of days. So that's different than Wisconsin. We don't have a lot of places that are that remote. Um, but we do have a ton of rural hospitals that are very, very important and integral to their uh, economies that have to get supported. And, and even though it's maybe, oh, it's 30 miles or it's 40 miles to the next hospital, um, that the economic value of that hospital, you think about if you lose that hospital, just the one I was talking about in Indiana, 700 people lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And the effect on that, not to mention the challenges in getting uh, coverage for your workers' comp insurance goes up if you can't, if you don't have a local hospital, you know, all of these kinds of things, um, you know, we have to think of. And I think, again, the business community, in my experience, has been left out of the discussion in, in how important it is as the business community, the hospitals, which is a business, but also has a social function as well. So um, bringing those together is really important. Um, and the smaller your community, the more important that probably is. Great, thank you. Um, I think for both you and Dr. Raymond, uh, there's been some conversations recently uh, in the news about, um, I'm sure you'll know the name better than me, Rem Silvier, um and the potential of a vaccine can you just review with us for a moment you know what what's the the pipeline for relief look like i don't know dr raymond you want to take that one um, I'm, yeah <laughs> sure um vaccine timeline there's a lot of activity going on a lot of corners being cut that would have never been cut before um, but some optimism that we may have a usable vaccine in scale by sometime this fall I know the initial optimistic projection was for January, um, but there's a lot of great work going on. Happy to talk about the specifics maybe at another webinar. Just in terms of remdesivir, um, it's not a magic bullet. It seems to be useful in reducing the hospitalization time for patients early in the course of a COVID-19 infection, but perhaps not particularly useful later on. And there was another study that showed a five-day course is as efficacious as a 10-day course. That's important because um, there's not a lot of scale for the availability of remdesivir. So if you can give it 
for five days to two people, that's better than giving it for 10 days to one. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and, and one of the other questions I have um, is a question I got yesterday. I had the chance to testify with the Assembly uh, Committee for State Affairs. And one of the questions I got that I think it's always important to be coming back to is, you know, have we overreacted? Isn't is this a proper reaction to what we're facing? We've done well in Wisconsin, and you know, maybe we shouldn't have gone as far as we did. And I'd just be interested to hear both of your thoughts on that, and then we'll jump to our CEOs. By the way, Missy, great testimony. I read it. You did a, you did a fantastic job. Thank um, you. I mentioned you, Dr. Raymond. How about that? <laughs> that, that might be why I liked it, who knows. <laughs> what I could say, Missy, is the simple answer is no, we've not overreacted. Again, we have flattened the curve, we've reached an equilibrium, but all you need to do is take a look at Brown County and what happened there to understand that um, we've got a potential forest fire here with embers still burning that could ignite at any time and that we need to maintain vigilance. So that's a simple answer. It's no, we did not overreact. Great, thank you. Dr. I would, I, I would concur. I think that um, there's always a tendency after the fact to say, well, we didn't really need to do all of that, but the reason we're where we are is because we did all that, you know? And again, I think if you think about either Brown County or what I was describing in Indiana, it takes one. One outbreak can flatten a community mm -hmm their and their health, entire healthcare system and you know people are still having babies and they're still having heart attacks and they're still having you know all of the other things that we have um and and a rural county cannot handle that um when they have one outbreak it it will just roll over the whole system and that's still an that's still a risk the other thing i think that i'm worried about is the delaying of care so one of the ways that we we combated this is a lot of care has now been put on hold people's breast cancers aren't getting diagnosed because they're not getting their mammograms people's you know um other heart conditions are going to come you know come out about it as a heart attack rather than as something treatable because we've had to push things so far down the road um and without the, if we don't keep that curve flattened that is going to go on for a very long time so we need to to get back to normal health care as well as keeping the covid situation at a, at a level we can manage thank you well thank you both again for for joining with us and uh, i hope you can stick with us as long as you can um, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Michelle, you are the CEO of Kohl's Corporation, and I hope you'll share with us not only, uh, you know, a little bit about Kohl's or a lot of it about Kohl's, but also uh, what you've been seeing and, and what Kohl's has been facing through this process. And I hate to tell you this, Michelle, but it looks like you're muted. Again. <laughs> there you are. How about Great. now? You're perfect. Okay. Good, good. Well, I was just saying, um, Missy, a uh, big thank you to inviting me to this important you know, conversation. I'm really passionate about health and wellness overall, and it's a really important topic for Wisconsin and, and the country and the world at large. And I'm really proud of how Kohl's is navigating this, this crisis. Um, before I get into the specifics on the COVID impact, uh, let me just, for those who aren't living and breathing Kohl's every day, talk a little bit about the company. Um, we are a national retailer here in the U.S. We have about 1,160 stores. We employ 100,000 people across the country. And then here in Wisconsin, we employ about 10,000 people, half of which are in our corporate headquarters, and then the other half working in our 42 stores across, um, across the state. Uh, we also serve 65 million customers, um, you know, throughout throughout the year, and um, the majority of our business is actually in our stores. We've been very pleased with how our digital business over the last five years has really accelerated. But 75 percent of our business, the core of who we are um, for over 50 years, has been about serving customers in our stores. Um, you know, clearly, given that we are a store business, um, the impact of COVID-19 has had a major impact to our business. So on March 19th, we voluntarily closed all 1,160 stores across the country as we saw what was happening with the health of our country. Um, we are deemed a non-essential retailer, although as I'll share a little color on what we're seeing in our business, um, clearly we're selling a lot of things that our customers really want during this time in shelter. 
Um, so first thing we did, like I said, is um, we closed our stores. Um, we didn't know at that time, and we're still closed today, how long that that would continue. That resulted in furloughing uh, 90,000 of our employees. So the vast majority of our people working in our stores, of course. Um, I would say the, the silver lining in that was we did, we did cover 14 days of pay. Um, and as that 14 days was ending, the federal program was kicking in. So the enhanced unemployment. So um, feel good that our uh, associates are being taken care of. We are also during this time while they're furloughed, taking care of all their health care as well. And um, we do communicate them regularly. Communication has been a critical part of how we've been navigating through this. So not only for folks who are still working with us, but even those furloughed. And we, we very much look forward to the day when we, we bring them back into our stores. And I hear very regularly from our people and from our customers how they're looking forward to that day. Um, but that day will come when we can open in a very safe manner. I will get to that in a moment, just as an aside. Um, I mentioned our digital business. It is a, is a very significant business for us today. It's 25%. Um, it's over $4 billion. We sell a lot of products through that channel. And um, we have seen during this time our customers really engaging with that channel. So we're keeping a relevancy in their lives. Um, we are seeing product that one would expect during this time um, while, they're, while they're staying at home and even things to keep their, their home a little bit cleaner. So we're selling a lot of vacuum cleaners and air purifiers, a lot of cleaning things for the house, um, and also on the cooking side. So the Instapots and the cookware and what have you. So we're really pleased that we can serve the customer at this time. And um, throughout this period where our stores have been closed, we also introduced curbside drive up. Um, we're doing that in a very safe way. Our associates are wearing masks and gloves, et cetera. And that has become very popular during, during this time. But, um, but clearly the issue is our stores. Um, I'd say while we've been operating this channel, we have obviously had to ship product, um, majority going to people's homes. So our, our e-commerce fulfillment centers have continued to be open as well as our call centers. And um, right out of the gate, um, we have a very strong crisis management team. We're an operationally oriented company. So right you know, beginning of March, that team was engaged to make sure that we had all the supplies um, and could support our operations even when our stores were going to be closed for a bit. So we're using all the protective um, gear in terms of masks and gloves. We take temperatures as our associates come in. They answer wellness screens. Um, we don't count absenteeism. So if someone isn't feeling well or is concerned to come in, it's fine. That doesn't count against them. And as a result, while we've been operation during this period, we've had very few cases of COVID-19 and, and we're quite happy about that. Um, importantly, as we look to the future, you know, clearly we are looking forward to the day when it's right, when we can open stores. And um, the team has done a lot of work during the last six weeks to prepare for that day. So benchmarking and best practicing across all industries um, within our retail advocacy groups as well. And so, um, you know, we know that when we open to serve our customers, it's going to be in a new way. So um, just to give you a little bit of color, I won't share every detail of the literally 50 page playbook that the team has put together because it's very important. Like I said, we're, we're a great operator. We hold that bar really high. And when we open our doors, we want to make sure that our people are safe and that our customers are safe as well. So um, to give you a couple examples, um, we will operate with reduced hours. Um, we will dedicate special hours for populations at risk that only that group can shop. Uh, we have created graphics that will go throughout the store on social distancing. We are in right now, as we speak, installing plexiglass barriers that will go around all of our cash wraps. And one of the things about Kohl's, and I know, um, again, I think it's one out of every two Americans shops Kohl's, so probably many on the webinar have been in our store. They're big. They're spacious. And so I think, you know, in terms of being safe and social distancing, um, I actually think that will not be a challenge at all for us. Um, in terms of, you know, the procedure of customers coming in, we're going to close one of our entrances so we can have a greeter, make sure that we are not, you know, getting too many customers in the store, which we're not envisioning to be a problem. We'll be wiping down carts between every use. We'll be wiping down the registers. 
uh, gloves, masks, taking temperature of our associates as they come in. And even for our associates, we're doing lots of things in the break rooms as well to make sure that, again, they can operate in a safe way. So it just really does um, give you a sense that we're taking this extremely seriously um, to make sure that, like I said, come the day when we open our doors, both our associates and our customers will feel welcomed and they'll feel very safe. Thanks, Michelle, for that. So it's interesting, you know, on the poll that we did, I'm just trying to look at the picture of it. Um, about 30% said that uh, their business is going to need to recalibrate slightly. And about 33% said reorganize operations for moderately different client needs. Where do you, where do you find holes in that scale? Do you feel like having to to revamp or what do you see as the new normal and, and your approach to it? Yeah, I mean, we, we do expect that as we start opening stores, the business is going to look and feel differently. You know, we know that it's going to build back over time um, and that's okay. We've planned for that. You know, I should, you know, probably make a mention that obviously economically this has been a challenge for the company because we have 75% of our business that's not operating. We entered this period with a very strong balance sheet. We've been able to tap the markets to make sure we have enough liquidity to get through this period. And I'm feeling very, very confident on that front. So, so that has impacted, you know, in the, in the short to medium term, it will impact our business in terms of investments we make and what were the plans pre-COVID, but we're prepared to navigate. Again, the most important thing is that we can serve our customers again in this new normal. I would say from how we operate inside of our stores, I already gave you a sense of, you know, we're operating differently in our support buildings. So our fulfillment centers, as our store fulfillment centers come online, they'll also have all the protocols. Uh, probably worth mentioning as well with our call centers, and that's a big part of our, you know, we, we do a lot of work with our call centers, both in terms of our Coles Charge program and our loyalty program and our dot-com business. We've actually, through this process, been able to get the majority of our Wisconsin and Texas-based associates to work from home. And that wasn't a capability we had before. So that has changed, and our technology team did a great job um, in standing up that capability um, to provide that, that option for our associates. So that's been a big win. And then in terms of the operations inside the store, we're making changes. Like I said, we're going to have like an associate that's at the front of the store who's going to be greeting and wiping carts. We're changing our returns protocol. Um, you know, one of the things we introduced at Kohl's, I got a lot of publicity, was our Amazon returns program. And, you know, as that product comes in, we've created new safety protocols to make sure that product is handled appropriately, safe for customers, safe for associates. We'll have a dedicated Amazon station, a dedicated cold return station. So all those details really need to be thought through. And um, all of our associates coming back to work when they come back to work are going to go through a very rigorous training to make sure they know how to operate in this new normal. Great. Um, one of the things, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Um, can you share your guidelines and your set of guidelines so that we can think about other retail in Wisconsin opening? And do you think, you know, you and I have talked about in the past that the big retail and the little retail, how do you, how do you see those working together in this new normal? Yeah, Missy, and thank you. And it's been great um, for us to have these conversations of late. We, the, the, the bar we set for ourselves is we want to be seen as the model of what it means to operate a safe, clean, and still welcoming environment. And um, we have great experts that we've worked with inside the company, outside the company, and we're happy to share our protocols, every detail the team has thought through. So, so any retailer, or any operator out there, um, we will happily support with everything we're doing. Great, thank you. Well, I wanna um, be sure that we get a chance to talk with Dave. Um, so Michelle, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Cindy. I hope you're able to stay for a few more minutes if you hear any more questions that we can come back to you with. Sure, uh, happy to stand. Dave, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you can mm. you know, tell us a bit about your company, tell us about what you've been facing with um, the COVID-19 crisis and, and how your company is approaching it. Sure, thanks, but thanks Missy. And Thanks to Synergy and the rest of the Leadership Council for inviting me today. Um, 
We're a, we're a manufacturer of machinery and equipment that make bridges move. Draw bridges, lift bridges, swing bridges. And we make dam gate hoists. Then we do a lot of work for the Army Corps of Engineering, building machinery and equipment that make not only gates move, but miter gates, locks, for example. Um, we're, um, we have a project right now in, uh, in West Palm Beach, for example. When you cross this bridge, the first place on the left is President Trump's Mar Largo. Now, some have speculated that the Ukrainians paid for the bridge. Uh, we don't think so. That's, a, that's an attempt at some humor, sorry. Um, our organization has responded much like others with, uh, with the COVID virus. We have all the protocol, protocol in place that I'm sure all the manufacturers are instituting. We're a small organization, so we're very nimble. We were able to put into uh, our, our practices in place very quickly. Uh, we also have people that work remote. Uh, we have engineering managers and estimating manager that work remote and have been. So we're pretty well versed up the curve in how to do the remote thing. We sent uh, almost all of our office folks home. Uh, we sent the internet phone with them, something we had just procured. So you plug the phone in and it's like you're in your office. It worked out very nicely. Um, we also took in from an operational standpoint, we had worked four tens on second shift. On first shift, we initiated four tens as well. And then on Friday, our skeleton crew in the office works from home. So on Fridays, we're dark. And what that's done, that's eliminated 20% of our, our employee contact, uh, which is significant. The other you know, best practice I'd like to share with small employers, um, they need to have a day after plan, not just a succession plan, where you're trying to groom somebody to eventually fill a spot. But if the worst happens, how does the operation continue the next day? So everyone should, in a leadership role, should be looking at who's gonna do what work uh, should that happen. Now I'm also, uh, I'm chairman of the board for the Central Wisconsin Metal Manufacturers Alliance. We have 95 members of which 75 are manufacturers and I had a chance to talk to a number of our, of our um, members and how they're being impacted. Some are severely impacted, up to 70% reduction in revenues, uh, 40 to 50% is very common. And I asked what the outlook is like, and they're already seeing reduced forecasts for the third quarter. So uh, if this thing were to turn quickly, it's still gonna be a rough third quarter for, for manufacturing. Uh, one other thing I was asked to comment on was the bounce back plan. Um, I read it, I found it very interesting. There was a one point there where it talked about shifting from boxing people to boxing the virus, which makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, hopeful, listening to uh, Dr. Leonard earlier, hopefully that's gonna be initiated more, I would think on a county county or case by case basis, not a one size fits all. So we're encouraged encourage that that's the way it will, it will happen. Um, I think all of us in manufacturing will do what we need to do, but we'd like to get to the point as quickly as possible where we can try to go full speed ahead. So that's all, that's what I have, Missy. My dog was barking, so I needed to uh, <laughs> mute myself there. Dave, can you react a little bit to this survey? So we're seeing, you know, just a slight reorganization for folks where I think folks are feeling like uh, they'll be able to return to work. 60% um, or so are saying, you know, with some modifications. How do you feel about like when you get fully rolling again uh, and you have your workforce coming and going? Um, how do you see that working? You know, our business my personal business is really not being that well or that impacted. Uh, again, we do nothing that's discretionary. Everything we do is infrastructure work that has to get done. Some of the members of SWIMA, on the other hand, are seeing dramatic impacts to their business. Some may not survive this. You know, they don't have the capital, the cash to make it to the point where this thing starts turning around. Others are weathering the storm the best they can. It's ironic, 90 days ago, we were actively trying to find more employees for the work that we had. Now we're actively trying to find work to keep our employees. It's, it's a dramatic swing. So yeah. hopefully we can swing back 
you know, to having full backlogs and, and full employment. So one of the questions I've gotten, Dave, is can you say whether or not you're going to keep the four day, 20 hour shifts or um, I wonder if that's a typo. Okay, we'll let that the, Well, the four day, 10 hour shift. Four day, 10 four hour tenths. shift. Yeah, four tenths. Yeah. Well, you know, I know our people probably love it for the three day weekend, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll likely once coast is clear, if you will, migrate back to uh, five days. Yeah. And have you made shifts on your floor? Have you changed your protocols to address, you know, making sure you don't have pinch points or staggering shifts or anything like that? We do. Now, we're a relatively small employer, okay. but we do make sure whenever it, a machinist comes into a machining center, for example, they wipe down the control panels and all shared devices. When they leave the shift, they do the same. And when the next shift comes in, we repeat that. Also, throughout the day, twice a day, minimally, all touch points are wiped down with a disinfectant. And then we socialize. We show we have the distance, the social distancing. We don't have more than one person in a room at a time. Great, thank you. So let me bring it back. I have both Michelle and Dave, and I want to ask you, uh, you know, from your positions as CEOs, what is the biggest change you've seen in, you know, how you're approaching um, this strategic challenge to your business? What's the what's the thing that you've done differently that you feel has been really effective and has really uh, helped grease the wheels for getting through this? And maybe Michelle, we'll start with you and then we'll come to Dave. So uh, great question, Missy. You know, as, as a leader, you're always growing and learning and I don't think any of us would have ever anticipated a challenge like this. Um, and um, how to navigate this in ways that you're, you're being true to the seriousness and, and the concerns that are happening while also providing hope and optimism for your people. So I, I start by answering the question saying, I think it's really important as you're leading through this crisis to uh, lead in a way that, uh, that their associates feel safe and confident that we can come out the other side and, and inform them oftentimes you know, their employer is where they're getting a lot of their information. So we've gone above and beyond to communicate um, using lots of also new tools and technologies that um, we haven't used before. As an example, I do a weekly video every Monday to mm -hmm. share the latest on what's happening both with the virus at large and then what's happening on our business and then any new developments type things. So I think that's been a critical, uh, critically important as well as the leaders on my team doing similar things to communicate with yeah. their teams. I've been amazed by the way with, you know, we talk about um, our associate base and our store, a lot of our store associates are, are furloughed as I mentioned, but our corporate office, you know, all the work that continues and they're doing it remotely. And I've just been incredibly impressed that they've been able to do that kind of work. I mean, we're in the product development business. We work with vendors and and to do all of that um, from their homes. It's just been astounding, the commitment we've seen. So I'd say that's number one. The second piece is this has really been a time where it's time as industries to come together. And I'm spending a lot of my time working with other leaders in the retail industry and other CEOs from across the country and the world as we share and exchange best practices. So, you know, closer to home in the in the retail industry, companies that on during normal times we'd consider to be competitors, this is bigger than all of us. So how do we collaborate? Because ultimately the the goal here is as we start opening up that we're doing it safely for everyone. So it you know, the, the, the paradigms of we're competing against this person for clothes or what have you, that's so much smaller than the big issues we're tackling today. Uh, that's a really, really interesting point. Thank you for that. And Dave, what are you seeing as the big, the big change in your leadership that you've taken on uh, in the last few weeks? Well, we're a project driven business. Everything we do is driven by timelines. It's extremely critical. We have things done on time. And so you have to have a, a sense of urgency throughout the business to get things done. So what we've done, what I've personally had to do is, is try to make sure, well, as I stated, the only worst thing than overreacting to this would be underreacting. 
So our go get it done attitude had to get tempered a bit and make sure we're following the protocols and listening to the experts. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. I'll tell you, it's difficult because it's not our nature. Yeah. It's so interesting with the challenges that everybody is facing in the day-to-day -day crisis. It feels like everything has to be in, you know, you got to go, go. And that's really, you know, you also have to communicate and bring your team along. And I'm, you know, I'm finding a little bit of fatigue from the uh, having to talk to each other three times, you know, because you're doing it remotely, you don't necessarily get all the points covered. And, and so there is, you know, I think we'll, we'll go through waves of uh, speeding up and slowing down and um, yeah, it, and depending on how people are feeling about that. Well, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I really appreciate you all uh, joining us today. Do you have, uh, Jay, do you have any final thoughts? I would like to share uh, everybody to go to Trades of Tomorrow website and look at the heavy metal tour that our, our organization promotes to get kids interested in manufacturing. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Michelle, do you have any final thoughts? Sure. Um, well, we look forward to the day when we open our doors and I just invite everybody on the call and friends and family <laughs> to come and see um, you know, Cole's in the new normal, and we look forward to serving you. Thanks, Michelle. I look forward to having Wisconsin employees get back to work at Cole's as soon as we can. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> and Dr. Dawson, you're still with us. Thank you so much. Do you have any final thoughts? Support your local healthcare workers. You know, it's a, they're doing a tough job. Um, medical students are, you know, engaging in this at a time when their futures look a lot different and, and scarier than they used to going to medical school. So um, just uh, do what you can to be supportive and follow, follow the stay at home rules and wear a mask, <laughs> wash your hands. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's, it's always good. I, I, I've been saying that, you know, at, the, at least once a day in my notebook of notes that I, I keep, I write healthcare in all caps uh, to keep it first and foremost in my minds because it's taking an incredible, uh, carrying an incredible burden on its shoulders and taking an incredible hit at the same time. So I want to remind you all of the Regional Leadership Council, our partners that have brought us this uh, this series together. We have another uh, webinar next week and we look forward to bringing yet another group of um, up-to-date information, but also another great group of CEOs to join us. Um, after this, we're going to be sending out another uh, survey about the Badger Bounce Back Plan in Wisconsin Ready. Um, we did that last week, but we feel like we, uh, because of the technical difficulty, to get additional feedback this week. So look for that in your emails and please uh, dig in and help us understand the solutions that have been put forward so we can keep working together and, and thinking your minds together. Again, to the panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you all next week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.